Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You're watching Out Here in the Redwoods. I'm your host, Denise Riles, and I am so pleased to bring you today a person we all need to listen to. And uh, if you have any young ones in the uh, high school age range or younger, bring them on in. I think you want to listen to this. We have Mr. Bernard Marx. Aloha. Uh, hello. Welcome. Thank you very much. You are a person of interest. You've come here to our town to uh, do lectures, give discussions about your life story. My grandfather um, fought in World War II, and that's why you're here. Where were you during World War II? To begin with, I was in the town that I was born, which is Lodge, Poland. And uh, basically, you have to take it back to the moment of a young boy who saw something that's unbelievable. And that was the invasion of the Nazis occupying our city on September the 9th, 1939. And being interested in the camera, I mm -hmm. followed the camera around to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was rather unusual in that, first of all, I was out there on the main plaza, which is called Freedom Plaza, mm -hmm. handing out slices of watermelons to our Polish troops to go to the front. Oh, wow. Unfortunately, our troops never made it out of the city because they only had horse and buggies, you might say. They didn't have any tanks or trucks. They were oh. basically on horses. Oh, my. While on the other side, the Germans were already marching into our city with tanks and big trucks. And what I saw was most unusual is that our local population, how well they were prepared for the invasion. How did your parents prepare you? My parents didn't prepare me at all. It was all of a sudden, you might say. Uh -huh. And uh, to get back to the, to the invasion, you might say, mm -hmm. or to well, the yes, invasion. Entry, entry of the German troops. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was on the main street, how well the city hall organized the welcoming of the troops, mm -hmm. including the Heil Hitler, oh including my. being greeted with flowers, and greeting them with music. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason for that, which I knew, because part of our population was Volksdeutsche, meaning they were of German ancestry. Uh -huh. And they just loved to see the Germans come back and take over. Right. So I followed the camera to various places to see what's going on, because in Lodge, we had a large photographic university. Oh, great. So as a youngster, uh, almost the age of eight, you're sort of curious, what's yeah. going to happen? Yeah. And I saw some things which were most unusual. They started hanging people on lampposts just to make fun of them so they can have their picture taken. Oh, my goodness. Or the other little incident that I saw, which was very traumatic to me, I was going to visit my father, actually, subsequent to handing out the slices of watermelon. Mm -hmm. And that was also on the Freedom Plaza. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was a man standing on the third floor at the windowsill, screaming bloody murder. And what he was screaming about was that the Germans wanted to destroy a monument on the central plaza, which was Freedom Plaza. Uh -huh. And that was a monument of Tedyush Kosciuszko. And who's that? A general. Okay. To me, he was a hero. Mm -hmm. Not only was he a hero to me, but he was a hero to the entire Polish population. Because what he did... He came to the shores of these United States before the United States was formed. Oh. <laughs> and helped fight in order to form the new the colonies. Okay. He was a general. They gave him the rank of colonel. Okay. The only place you find a statue of him is at West Point and no place else. And 
after the colonies were formed, he went back to Poland to fight the Tsar. Oh my goodness. And then he went back and fight Napoleon, always for the purpose of freedom humanitarian. So he was a hero. Mm -hmm. The gentleman standing on the windowsill screaming bloody murder, he wanted to know what do you have against a piece of marble? Yeah. And told the entire story as what I just told you now, except more elaborate, yeah. as to what the general did. Unfortunately, either he fell, or he jumped, or mm -hmm. he was pushed, mm -hmm. and he fell right by my feet on the sidewalk. And here I am, a youngster of nearly eight years of age, I saw a split head mm -hmm. open with blood and scrambled eggs on my shoes, which actually was the brain. Oh my goodness. So for that, I really don't need a picture. No, of course not. So that was the first thing. And the second thing I saw was, like I mentioned, but the hanging of people on, the, on lampposts, not to kill him, but just to hang him up on a lamppost and uh, to have their picture taken so they can send it home, I, I make assumption. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they really did real hangings. Mm -hmm. They brought out a platform, stood up, and brought out approximately 40 people. Mm -hmm. All of us who lived in that particular neighborhood called Bazaar Platz, we all had to come out and stand there and watch what they were doing. Actually, what they did is set up a gallows. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. And they brought out 40 of very intelligent people. Uh, I could probably name you everyone by the first name, by the last name, and the profession, right. which I will discuss tonight. But I'll tell you, it was the, the, it was the doctor, the lawyer, the professor, mm -hmm. the journalist, mm -hmm. the butcher. Mm -hmm. And the most horrible portion that I saw, and I have a complete archival film of what they did on that particular day. It's a Nazi film. Mm -hmm. Because they filmed it, they took pictures, and I stood there watching as they were placing the noose around the neck of every one of those individuals. And then oh on top of it, they would ask, is the noose too tight? But that's not the story at all. What really was traumatic to me is I saw them put the noose around the neck of my teacher. Oh my goodness. And they hung her. Wow. That's, that's life in the ghetto. That's yeah. the beginning. So it's, it's your show. Yes. You asked the question. Well, absolutely. My next question was, at this point, I'm sure you're thinking, this is big trouble. Describe to me the moment that you and your family were taken from your home because you practiced the Jewish faith. What well, was that moment? Did you <clears throat> try to hide? See, we don't learn any of this in our history books. Uh, for myself, it's pretty much glossed over. And you're really opening my eyes. Whitewashed, you mean? Yes. Whitewashed. So you're really opening my eyes to the <clears throat> actual horrors that many encountered during this time period. Um, and I can just only imagine. And I'm, I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're able to speak about it. Um, and not whitewash it and tell the truth about what really happened. So let's uh, talk about the day you guys were taken. Where did you first end up? Well, at first what happened was they basically took all the Jewish people and shoved them into the slum area of the city. Okay. Uh, the slum area was a very dilapidated part of the city. And that's not the ghetto. That is the ghetto. Okay, that then, is the ghetto. Then okay. they formed the ghetto. They put up barbed wires all around us. Uh, they selected those who were able-bodied workers as slave laborers uh -huh. because being an industrial city, they could do something with us. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had resorts where you have factories, mm -hmm. various factories producing various things for the Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, we were called free workers but we were not free. We were basically slave laborers. Mm -hmm. We received nothing else 
for our 12-hour shift that we work daily, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. The only thing we received was a bowl of soup, mm -hmm. which was vegetable soup, and a slice of bread. And the slice of bread you had to buy. And what did an eight-year-old do for 12 hours a day, seven days a week? I was a cloth cutter. A cloth cutter, okay. Yes. And the only reason that I became a cloth cutter is my father had the audacity, you might say, or the foresight to lie to the Gestapo by registering me that I was born in 1927, not in 1932. Made me five years older. Okay. As a result of that, I've managed to stay within the ghetto mm -hmm. because children under the age of 10 were not permitted to stay there. They, the Germans said, Children under the age of 10 are really not workers. They need schooling, they need sports, they need education, they need all of that. And they would be sent to what's called a colony, a special place out in the countryside. Hmm. Unfortunately, that was a lie. Mm -hmm. Because basically what they did, they sent them to a place called Helmo. And Helmo was, children would arrive that day and they would put them in a the gas chamber and the next day they would just cremate him. Holy moly. See, nobody talks about that. No, because uh, the Germans managed during the process of four and a half years, uh -huh. uh, was in the five and a half years actually, they managed to exterminate a million and a half Jewish children. Right. They managed to exterminate six million Jews. And what the history does not tell you is they also managed to exterminate a half a million Jehovah Witnesses. Holy moly. And also, if you really want to take a full count of World War II because of a maniac with his mustache, uh -huh. uh, no one has, I don't even want to mention his name. Right, of course he does, not. Because he doesn't no. deserve it. No. As, as a process of war and a process of his quest of a million year quest reign over mm -hmm. the world to be king, mm -hmm. He managed to exterminate nearly 50 million people. 50 million? 20 oh. million Russians alone died on the, on, the, on the front. Oh my goodness. Three and a half million Germans too, also. So when you look at it in a totality, mm -hmm. it's, it's enormous what mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. during World War II. It's impossible to go ahead and really fathom the enormity of a maniac. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I give you this little information which you do not get in, in, in the books today. No. Historically, you don't get those pr in that perspective. No, no, you don't. But we do get the six million Jews. Mm -hmm. We do get as a totality. Right. If I were to ask you to go back now to the, where the city of Lodz, where I was born. Yeah. We started out in the ghetto with 166,000 people. Right. Because actually we had 322,000 people, but only 166,000 were put in the ghetto. The rest of them were sent to extermination camps. Mm -hmm. You will find a mass grave with a quarter of a million people in one mass grave. Wow. In the city of Lodz. Wow. That's, that's, Inconceivable, really. That's right. Inconceivable. So what were your conversations like within your family? And did you guys get separated or were you able no. to stay together? In the ghetto, we stayed together as a family. It's uh -huh. a matter of fact, I had a smaller brother, a younger brother. We had to hide him constantly. We used to put him in, into a bowl of, bowl of cloth and take him to the factory and hide him in the factory. Uh -huh. Or take him someplace else to hide him so they wouldn't take him. Uh, otherwise, he would have been exterminated was in the days that they would pick up all the children, the little ones on the street. They were also, I also chasing ch kids, including myself once in a while. I managed to hide in various, various alleys. Oh, good. But uh, ghetto life was not an easy life. Right. As a family, we stayed together until 1944, when the ghetto was liquidated. Okay. In August of 1944. And there we were promised that we were being sent to the mainland of Germany because in Germany we will have a good life. Mm -hmm. No longer will we be incarcerated in barbed wire. We will no longer 
have to worry about rations. We will be treated just like any other German. Yeah. And uh, you will go there with the family. You take all your machinery and all your all your working stuff, and you'll do the same thing there in on the mainland. But basically, that was another lie. And some of them, the people believed it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether the older generation believed it or not. I had my doubts. Even at eight years old, nine years no, old. This was already when I'm 12. You're 12, right. Yeah, when I'm 12. So um, basically, as a family of uh, nearly 200 of us, as a large, enormous family, we were given two cattle cars. Mm -hmm. And we were given a loaf of bread, each one. Uh, unfortunately, none of us ate the bread because we didn't know where we were going, we, so we sort of saved that loaf of bread. And uh, actually, when we arrived at the next destination in those locked kettle cars a couple of days later, it was Auschwitz. Wow. And Auschwitz uh, came the selection. Mm -hmm. And in the selection, it was a selection ramp. Uh, on that selection ramp, uh, there was an officer who would go left, right, left, right. Women and children had to go to the left side and men to the right side, and I was sort of the one in limbo. Mm -hmm. And my father, who had the foresight, and I always referred to my father as the, my angel because he saved me in the ghetto by making me older. Mm -hmm. Again, he stepped forward with copies of the documents, uh, my work permit, my uh, registration with the Gestapo and showed it to this German officer and said, my son was working for the German authorities for four years. I mean, he's strong and all that. Yeah. And the officer believed the lie. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, you can go with the men. Right. So he put me with the men and I stayed with the men. And then after that selection, all the men that they selected as slave laborers, again, we were stripped of our clothing. The only thing we were allowed to have was uh, our belts and shoes, and they shaved us everywhere um, and checked us for every office if we were hiding diamonds or uh, gold or whatever. Right. And uh, after that, we went to, we were sent to Birkenau. And Birkenau, which is the extermination camps, uh, we could smell the flesh on a daily basis from the chimneys coming out. Okay, and so they, th this was not a gas chamber, but these were cremations? These were cremations, yes. We, okay. we, I personally didn't know about the gas chamber until I got to Birkenau. Okay. Uh, or the cremation. The cremation then became evident right. as to what was happening. Because the women and children that same day that they were taken from the selection ramp were marched into a gas chamber and they were annihilated at that time. And then they were dragged out of there by a commando called the Canada Commando. And then they were actually burned mm -hmm. or put in the crema cremation. They had three, four crematoriums there. Right. So on a daily basis, they would exterminate anywhere between four to 10,000 people. Yeah. Uh, after that, we worked at the, as a commando against slave laborers, uh, building a road. And after that, uh, building a road, or we used to have what they call menial work just to kill you another way, we would take big stones from one side of the street and put it on the other side of the street so another group can pick it up from that side of the street and put it back on the other street. Oh, jeez. This was, this was <laughs> it's another way of exterminating people because they didn't give you any food, they didn't right. give you any water. In Poland, during the month of August and September is the hottest, most humid months. Yeah. So people were wow. dying as a result of that. Um, and after that, there was another selection. And luckily, my father and I, we were again selected uh, to go to the, next, to the next place. And the next place was Dachau, which was a four-day journey, locked up in cattle cars. Uh, we didn't get any food. We didn't get any water four days and four nights, and many people died on the way in those cattle cars, and mm -hmm. we stacked them up in the corner like a cord of wood to get them out, out of sight, and then when we arrived in Dachau, they would count how many people arrived, and, and the count was wrong, so we had to drag those corpses out of the cattle cars and lay them down there, and they counted the, the corpses, and then they were satisfied that the transport list was correct. Mm -hmm. 
and then we had to put them back in the cattle cars. So where's your mother and your little brother? I can only make the assumption mm -hmm. that on the 16th of August, 1944, when we arrived in Auschwitz, they were, that day, they were gassed and exterminated that day. That day? I can only make that assumption because maybe the ovens weren't big enough to handle all of those, so they would do it the next day. Oh, my goodness. So your father and you are the only ones that made it to Dachau. That is correct. Mm -hmm. And subsequent uh, to that, we were again selected from Dachau to go work for another uh, sub-camp sub, sub because Dachau had many, many little sub-camps, and right. we were sent to a place called Kaufering. In Kaufering area, there were 11 concentration camps, and there again we worked building a underground factory to which they were going to produce, not produce, they were going to assemble the ME-262 jet plane. So we built, we were the only ones to build that part of the factory. Uh, out of five of those factories, we were the only ones because we had on a daily basis somewhere between 20,000 to 30,000 people on a daily basis. Uh, there we were provided, if you came back from work alive, you were given a bowl of soup and a cup of bread, and I mean a slice of bread, and a mm. slice of bread was a little bit of straw in it, a little, so a little bit of sand, some, some flour to hold it together. Oh my goodness. Uh, the, the, the rations were approximately 500 calories a day, if that much. Mm -hmm. And we worked, uh, I worked, personally, I worked in a hole in the ground, about 30 meters deep, always at the water line, mm -hmm. extracting gravel so we can bring it up to the surface to mix it with sand and cement so they can build this monstrosity, which uh, I have pictures of it to show it, uh, that can be seen. And uh, then this was a nine and a half months of really hell. Mm. Towards the end of it, I became very ill. I came, became with typhoid fever, oh my. so I couldn't even work. So I mm -hmm. was in a sick camp. Uh, and my father used to come to me every day from his shift of work and bring me a cup of hot water. And I survived on two weeks on, on water, a cup of water a day, basically. Oh my. So at liberation time. Yeah, tell me about that, liberation <laughs> time. What was that day like? What happened? Uh, well, I have to sort of go back a day or two before that liberation time because the commanding officer of that particular camp, which was Hulach, which was the most notorious camp out of the Dachau camps uh, as a slave labor camp, mm -hmm. they, uh, the commanding officer decided that those of us who were ill, naturally we could not go on the death march so mm -hmm. he just put us back in those little huts that we were living in, and he locked the doors from the outside, nailed it shut, and sprayed the roof with gasoline, and put us on fire, live ones, about 600 of us. Uh, and I was one of those, so I still refer to my father, the angel, because he managed to drag me out of that little hut in order for me to go on the next journey. Oh, my goodness. And the goodness. next journey was basically those of us who were ill, but were not ambulatory enough, they would send us back on a train, okay. back to Dachau. And what they basically did is they loaded up the cattle cars with the sick of us. They, this time is the first time in the entire m numbers of journeys that we did that they didn't lock the doors, which was on the 25th of April, 1945. They left the doors open from both sides. They stopped the train because they already knew that the Allied planes will come and bomb every train because that was the orders the uh, Allies had is to put the trains out of commission, not knowing what was on that train. Right. And surely enough, the Allied planes arrived. Phew. And they bombed the locomotive first. The locomotive exploded. I saw people being hit by steam, and some of them died at the moment. Right. And 
those of us who are strong enough or will, strong will enough to jump out of those cattle cars, which both my father and, they and I, we did, we jumped out of the cattle cars. As the Allies were strafing the train and we were running into the woods, which was a very young forest, we were greeted by the Nazis with machine guns from both sides. So oh. they, were, they were mowing us down from one side and then the Allies were doing the helping from the top, not knowing what they were doing. Right. So you couldn't blame it. So basically, those of us who survived that little ordeal were collected again the next day and brought back to the camp. So on the 27th of April, 1945, at 8 o'clock in the morning, there wasn't a guard left. It was quiet, and the 12th Armored Division showed up to liberate us. Oh, my goodness. So if you really want to see a reproduction of what happened and what they saw, I suggest that the people in the audience or in your viewing area uh, buy the, uh, the CD from Spielberg, which is called Band of Brothers. Oh, Band of Brothers. Yeah, okay. Band of Brothers, and it would be disc number five. They reproduced the camp as to what they found in that particular camp. Some of it is a little bit of Hollywood, but that's okay. Right. The majority is correct. Uh, what the, Army, the 12th Armored Division found was basically the burned down huts. Yeah. Uh, a photographer from Michigan who was a sergeant by the name of Robert Hartwick, he took 47 pictures. Mm -hmm. Uh, to show his commanding officer, uh, he nearly got court-martialed for doing it because it was illegal to do have private cameras, but he did it. So he had to, he had to give the, the pictures and the negatives to the United States Army right. as their documentation, and they used those documentation for the Dachau trials. So basically, I took you through in a in a, in a quick sort of journey from. 1939 until the liberation of the 27th of April, 1945 in Germany, where I was liberated. And after liberation, you said after liberation. Yeah. Uh, I, I was still the youngster with the curiosity. Well, of course. And having survived the ordeal of all these various steps, I was still curious about the German people why didn't you do something? Why didn't you say something? Right. You saw us slaving away, you saw us working there, and you never saw us. You never did anything to stop it. Right. Uh, so as a, you might say as a curious individual, I started asking people on the main plaza in Landsberg, where I was working during the nine months, uh, off and on I was working on the plaza, or I was working on the old mountain road, in the winter and 30 degrees, minus 30 degrees with no shoes and just wearing a set of pajamas, basically a pair of pants and a shirt and no cap. Right. Uh, why didn't you do something? They said, well, there was no concentration camp here. I said, how is that possible? Oh. How is that possible that there was no concentration camp? They had blinders on. They had blinders on. Yeah. So. Uh, I just wanted to know how was it for, did you have any Jews in this town prior to World War II? Yeah. And they said, oh yeah, we had 12 families. I said, oh, well, what did you do about it? Oh, we collected money to get them out of, get, get them out of Germany. Right. But they emphasized the word, we had no anti-Semitism in our city. How yeah. is it possible you had no anti-Semitism when you collected money to get the Jews out of here? So right. there must have been some, something anti-Semitic. Yeah. Yeah. So I just went back to the local newspaper, to the archives, and started searching for documentation. Right. I thought I'd become a historian all, already. <laughs> right, right, right. And here today, you yeah. do a lot of volunteer work. You're here giving presentations. And if we could get a nice close-up, you are wearing a wonderful pin on your collar. Yes, I do. Who did you get that from, and what does that mean? <laughs> Well, this one, this little pin here is very dear to me because I received that from President Barack Obama as a volunteer national award, as a volunteer national award volunteer because I do lots of pro bono work. Mm -hmm. 